today's subject is going to be regarding the critics of biblical creation regarding the observed pedigree germline mutation rate. They say these rates should be rejected because they don't take into account purifying selection over time. Let's see if that's true, shall we? Critics have said that over time, purifying selection must be removing mutations and this would slow down the rate over time and get us away from those pesky young earth creation dates. So one of their favorite studies that they go to to invoke this is titled Correcting for Purifying Selection an Improved Human Mitochondrial Molecular Clock. The critics of these pedigree mutation rates use the fossil record to calibrate their clock. Then what they do is called retrofitting the data. So they slow the clock down by just invoking purifying selection, but they don't actually know when or how, meaning it's all speculative. But let them have it. So their evidence for this new slower mutation rate is that they say, if we calibrate this clock to chimps and humans split six million years ago, and we use the rate going backwards in time, adding purifying selection, we land on known ages of human migration such as the Canary Islands and other remote Oceania Islands, including the migration rate of Native Americans into the Americas, and even the Out of Africa event itself. If that's true, that's actually pretty amazing, right? But is it? Let's see how good this evidence really is. First off, is the rate they used consistent in their new and improved clock? No, it's not. It fluctuates, but more on that later. Let's start with the Canary Islands, which they place the date of inhabitation by the Berber people dated to 2.2 to 2.4 thousand years ago. This is based on a date obtained from a study that I found in Spanish by radiometric dating of sharpened retouched basalt flakes used for tools tested using the potassium to argon method. So their substitution rate was based on the estimated age of the clade being 2.9 thousand years ago and 2.25 thousand years ago with their unpublished rate. Not bad, right? Only off a little bit in the grand scheme of things. However, let's look at other studies which place the actual initial inhabitation of the islands much later. You see, the Canary Islands were first discovered around 25 BC when they were finally inhabited sometime between around 101 to 200 AD and the 5th century. These dates come from multiple lines of independent evidence, including what we know from the Romans that discovered the islands, which coincides with their new skills and developments in sailing technology that enabled the colonization of other oceanic islands and Southeast Asia, the North Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean, including direct written documentation by Pliny the Elder in Naturalis Historia, directly pinpointing this date, who also documented that there was no human presence on the island at that time, meaning there were no indigenous Berber people there yet. And these dates are also corroborated with a total of 713 radiocarbon dates compiled from 217 different sites on the island, obtained using Byzantine statistical modeling, and all of them pointed to the same time frame of the first century, including the fact that known mutation rates can explain the diversity of these people using the observed fast rate of mutation from these pedigree studies? Or should we just trust only the dates obtained from a single study that dated basalt, where the rocks that were sharpened were made from this very basalt, that gives dates literally thousands of years older than what we have any evidence for from any other source, all from a dating method that cannot even get the ages of known rocks correct, just so that they can match their own new mutation rate clock? Of course not. That's ridiculous. It should be blatantly obvious to anyone that isn't biased that we should go with the actual known dates based on literally written documentation and corroborated with other independent lines of evidence such as advancements in sailing at the time, the detailed documentation of oceanic travels at the time, the evidence from ancient Roman jars that were found on the coast, and even the reason that the islands were inhabited in the first place, which is the earliest signs of purple dye used by the Romans, only goes back 1200 BC. And the main reasons the Romans used the Canary Islands at all was for purple dye manufacturing from the local mollusks that lived on the shore, 
obviously it wasn't until much later that they even needed this resource and brought the Berber people to the island with them, most likely to do the labor. So how can anyone try to say that their new and improved substitution rate places people on the island even a thousand years before the first use of purple dye in Rome was even a consideration, since there was no reason for Romans to even go to these inhospitable islands to begin with that lack resources and even require agriculture to live there. The truth is, the earliest we can place any people on the island at all is on the island of Lobos at just 300 BC. Every other island were hundreds of years later. Their arguments against it? You guessed it, an argument from silence. They stayed in the study. Well, earlier arrivals to the islands that did not leave a genetic trace cannot be ruled out. <laughs> this makes their new and improved molecular clock off by two to three thousand years. And this is just the start of the journey. If they are off by this much, just going back in time 2,000 years, imagine how far off they are when we get really far back in time. Next, we read about their mutation rate matching the migration of Native Americans over the Bering Strait into Canada, which is placed around 15,000 years ago. The problem? Zero actual physical evidence for this journey taking place at that time even exists. Even their own fossil record for that time period is empty. They don't even have a single piece of physical evidence to date to place on this time frame, meaning they have no verification at all. Backed up by literally nothing, they made up a slow mutation rate based on evolutionary coalescence equations to place it at a time when they think this happened. So basically nothing but an assertion based on circular reasoning, which means literally nothing and can be totally dismissed. When did the Native American people cross this area? Well. Let's look at history itself, and why they would have made this treacherous migration in the first place. Look at this old video I made on it real quick, and then we'll jump back into this. The Native American people. When did they get to America? Where are they from? The secular view is that 15 to 20,000 years ago, they crossed the Bering Strait. So they think, because their model claims this, then our model must be invalid. Well, let's stop for a second and think about this. What makes people migrate? Famine, war, civil unrest, these are the main causes. Well, since genetics has shown us that Native Americans are of Asian descent, more on that soon, we have to look to Asia to see what events may have caused a migration away from Asia, and in what direction they might have gone to determine the actual model. Not just throw out a random number without any evidence. Well, we see in 100 to 500 AD, the Roman Empire was expanding and going to war with everyone around it. They battled the Hunzes in Central Asia. And if we look at the Chinese calendars, we can actually see that their worst period in history falls on the age of unrest at that period in time. Since the safest way to migrate would have been east, it makes logical sense that they would have fled from a war-torn country to new lands. So this was most likely what caused migration. But there are other ways to tell if this is true. Another way to tell is language. Diachronic linguist Joseph Greenberg was investigating languages and discovered that the presumed 163 language families of today is actually much lower at just 83 or maybe less. This falls in line with Genesis 10, which tells us of the Babel dispersion of languages, which would be around 70. The language family of Native Americans fell within the high-level linguistic Amerind family combining all indigenous people of South America, North America, Alaska, Ninevist, and Greenland. You find the same conclusion in the book The Historical Linguistics of Native Americans, written in 1997. Lyle Campbell listed several hypotheses of the historical origins of the Amerindian language families. The first agrees with Greenberg's in that a single, one-language migration event is the best and most obvious. We should always apply Occam's razor whenever possible, and this is one of those cases. Next, genetic evidence. We have tested Native Americans and found they all contain the haplobe group Q. Now this Q only shows up in two people groups in Asia. So now we have the best evidence of all, biological evidence. This tells us the story of how migration happened, and we can see it in two events. The first was pushed east over the Bering Strait. The later migration went west and settled in Florida. 
When looking for documents in Native Americans in their own words, you can find a book called The Red Record. In it tells of not only the migration pattern, but how cold it was and how much ice there was when they traveled and then where they finally settled. So now we have multiple pieces of evidence that have all helped us puzzle together the history of America, which shows that natives migrated from Asia, they arrived far more recently than secular sources assumed, they are part of a larger linguistic family, and are traced genetically from Asia. War most likely pushed them into migration to America based on historical records. No more is there any mystery as to why the native people were here before anyone else discovered America, and it doesn't conflict at all with the Young Earth creation timeline. Now finally, to the last date, the Out of Africa Age dated between 50 to 60,000 years ago. They slowed the rate down using their coalescence calculation as much as they could and ended up getting an age range of 62,000 years, plus or minus 12,000. Not bad, right? Just a little bit older than the known fossils. So what did they originally say about this discrepancy about being a little too old? It's not them that are wrong with the new mutation rate. It's the fossil record that's wrong. It's just lacking evidence. <laughs> that's hilarious, right? Because it's literally the very fossil record that they used to calibrate this clock to begin with. And now they're saying it's wrong. There's not enough evidence. But get this, it's even better. The new news, if they're going to go by the fossil record, is even worse for them because a new study states that they found a modern human bone in a Laos cave that dates back to 86,000 years ago. And if they found one fossil, that obviously means there were people in the inhabited area well before this. These dates are not true history, but finding more fossils will only push the date back further and make their mutation rate off by that much more. So at first it was too slow, based on lack of evidence. But now it's too fast, with evidence, and their new and improved mutation rate is off by 24,000 years. So we're right back to where we left off with a mutation rate that actually doesn't line up to evolution at all. Basically, it's falsified yet again using their own fossil record dates. Darn you pesky bones in the dirt. Tell the story we want you to tell. So we have the first date off by two to 3,000 years. Then the next date is off by about 11,000 years. And then finally, we get the last final date that's off by 24,000 years. Clearly, the new and improved mutation rate clock is just as bad as the old one. Throw it in the trash where it belongs, because evolution is not true and also belongs in the trash. So what have we discovered? They created a mutation rate that matches their myth based on an ancestral split between humans and man, and invoked purifying selection that changes this rate over time as they needed it to, using their own timeline to calculate coalescence based on phylogeny, and then still got a rate that was off, and that doesn't even match known dates to their own record, let alone unknown dates of the deep past that are all assumed based solely on fossils or no evidence at all. This study is a joke, and another in the long line of bad rescue devices used to save a bad theory. We can actually have purifying selection occurring and not have it make much of an effect on the overall mutation rate. Let's go to a study published by Howell and colleagues. We read, taken together, the cumulative results support the original conclusion that the pedigree divergence rate for the control region is approximately 10 times higher than that obtained with the phylogenetic analysis. There is no evidence that any one factor explains this discrepancy, and the possible roles of mutational hotspots, selection, and random genetic drift, and limitations of phylogenetic approaches to deal with this high levels of homoplasty are discussed. And finally, we read their conclusions in this study by Sigurdur Daughter and colleagues conclude that selection is unlikely to be a major factor that underlies the difference between phylogenetic and pedigree divergence rates, which is not the same thing as saying that selection does not act on mtDNA, but it's not the main cause for what's causing the discrepancy between these fast and slow rates. At this point, the result suggests that selection has not preferentially distorted the pedigree mutation spectrum relative to the phylogenetic one. But we also find this pattern of new harmful SNVs, which are single nucleotide variants mutations, arising just 5,115 years ago. All of this makes perfect sense and fits with our model, but the theory of evolution cannot make sense of it without rescue devices. 
all they can do is throw out rescue device after rescue device after rescue device to save this dying theory. But it doesn't end there. There's even more bad news for evolutionists yet again. We don't have to look just to a small dyad or triad pedigree mutation rate study, but two different 50 generation deep unbroken chains of chicken pedigree mutation rate study. And guess what? Ah, you guessed it, the rate's 15 times faster than expected compared to the phylogenetic rate based on evolution. As they state, this is substantially higher than the avian rates estimated based on fossil calibrations. Surprise, surprise. The study even directly says that for a long time, scientists have believed that the rate of change in mitochondrial genomes was never faster than about 2% per million years. Previous estimates put the rate of change in the mitochondria genome at about 2% per million years. At this pace, we would not be able to spot a single mutation in just 50 years, but in fact, we spotted two of them. This deep-rooted pedigree study shows us that purifying selection had no effect, even over many generations, at slowing down the mutation rate. So here are the facts. We only have a single line of both male and female lineages going back to the recent past, landing directly on the biblical timeline. Both lineages today have low genetic diversity and a fast mutation rate. This combination can only be explained by a recent creation and a recent global bottleneck. The case for Genetic Eve living recently and directly landing on the biblical timeline is so overwhelming that critics have to reject the observable, testable, repeatable, and empirical rate of mutation found in published peer-reviewed scientific studies worldwide from independent scientists over decades of time which are used to make accurate, testable predictions all while advocating for their own evolutionary assumption mutation rate based on the fossil record that cannot make any accurate testable predictions and has been falsified time and time again and is not used in the field at all like the pedigree mutation rate is. The choice is obvious. 